Hey, what's up, everybody? BDL44 coming to another video. All right, so this is a little random in regards to basketball, but I kind of want to talk about what I see the Pistons doing in a certain area. I kind of like it. They are taking chances on players in the front court that other teams have kind of passed up on, it seems. They're taking on projects. It's the second one with James Wiseman. The last one they did was with Marvin Bagley. I like it because... Eventually, if you think like this, you're going to find yourself with 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 a chance to get lucky, a chance to to, to build a stacked basketball team um, without actually even trying, because this is the, the the formula that I've always put in, in mind when making this channel and talking about young players and guys that are busting things of that nature. And the only way small markets and teams that mortgage their, their future like the Lakers and Clippers are going to find themselves in a position to get out of the holes that they're in or attract the free agents that they're hoping to get is to have really, really, really good role players and teams that make it so that these team players know they can win a championship in your market. I'll go live in Utah if I know Utah is stacked and I got a chance to win because not only do I want to win, but I can make a lot of money from winning. So, you know, if the Lakers don't have their stuff together, the Celtics don't have their stuff together, Knicks or whatever, if I go over and see that Sacramento and Indiana are stacked, I'm probably just going to go holler at them for an opportunity at a ring. It doesn't matter who's the whose market has the opportunity. We're ring, ring chasing. You go look and see what's going on in Phoenix right now. Everybody's just flooding over there. Why? Because they got an opportunity. So I think that that's what the formula is for a team like Detroit. And how do you do that without spending a trillion dollars? Well, you got to do stuff like this. You got to make sure you draft correctly. And then you make sure you take chances on players, take risk on players, and maybe other people are afraid to do so. Especially if you're a small market, especially if you know that you don't necessarily have your core intact and you got a bunch of young players on rookie contracts at this point. You know, it's a little different if your team has four and five main star contracts um, because, you know, at the end of the day, your, your cap space situation is not going to allow for you to do as much. But a team like the Pistons, who have most of their young stars on rookie contracts, really can't afford to do just about anything they want. They could take on salaries if they want, try to get, bring themselves some more draft capital. Um, or they could take on projects such as, such as this, or both, obviously, but this is an option too. Or you just pick up guys that other guys are giving up on, who you know can help you with certain specific things. For them, it's rim protection. So what I see is, for example, they want to have Jalen Duran in place, but the way they, they see it also is they're looking at emerging teams like Orlando, who have a bunch of seven-footers, Cleveland, who has a bunch of seven footers, obviously uh, the, the two monsters over there in Milwaukee and, and Philly, uh, you know, Boston, of course, with their deep team and all the length that they provide. You want to put yourself in the best possible position to have length in the modern era. And while I don't think Wiseman and Durin and, 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 and those guys are as versatile because they can't put the ball on the floor like everybody in Orlando does. At the end of the day, if you have the size to match up, you're going to be good. Not only are you going to be good, but if you strike it rich, with these lottery picks that teams have given up on and you keep them in your organization, develop them, even if they don't reach a good place. If you have enough of those guys, you got high level bench and a much higher level bench. If you can keep them all from becoming chiefs in their minds and just fall in place with as roles. And, and when you look at players who have lost their confidence, so to speak, because I'm not sure that's really true with Wiseman, but when he hasn't had the opportunity to really have success, a goal to state, they don't want to wait for his timeline or whatever, which I think is silly. But if they had to do it for, for for financial reasons, it makes all the sense in the world, which I believe it was. Then, you know, you got to go ahead and strike an opportunity for yourself and take a risk. If you're pissed to just see if you could bring yourself the size necessary at such a high level, because at the end of the day, what you're going to want to do is spend about 10, 12 million dollars on a backup center who Wiseman is probably going to turn into anyway. So you might as well just bring him into your situation, develop him there from where he's at and see if he could turn into something then. When it's time to negotiate with Duran and Isaiah Stewart, if something goes left, you got a starting center in place right there. If things go right, you have enough size to put yourself in a position to continue to match up with those teams. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, you will not be without size. Whatever the case may be, you will not be without immense upside in that position. And that is what I like about the Pistons. They're going to be going forward, going up against teams that have Webb Banyama on it and, and Chet Holmgren on it and all these different guys that are coming up. They're going to want that, and so are you. 
whoever your team is, if you don't have them stilts, you're going to lose opportunities at rebounds, opportunities at being able to rim protect. And of course, you're not going to be scoring very much in the paint. So <clears throat> that's going to make life harder on you. And that's why I look at teams like the Clippers. You know, I don't know if they've I got to look at the trades that they've made to my mind. I I think they may have brought themselves a center. I think they got themselves plumbly, which I definitely think they should do that. That was a good move. Uh, so so that was something I was looking for them to do was to boost their center position that they have. But it was something that need, needed to be done. And if they didn't do it, uh, I didn't think they were going to be able to do much of anything. But uh, just just at a glance, and Plumlee should help a lot with that. I think at the end of the day, that's what it is, though. All teams, all teams need to have somebody that they can trust uh, at that center position, even though it's not our favorite position in the NBA these days because a lot of coaches want to sit these guys for good reason. At the end of the day, when they are out there, if you can't match up, it will be the difference for you if you can't shoot a ridiculous amount to make it make sense. Uh, like Portland did against the Lakers a few nights ago. If you're not shooting 50% from behind the arc and you don't have that type of size against Orlando, Cleveland, and now Detroit, etc., cetera, uh, you're not going anywhere. You're just not going to beat them in a seven-game series. You might get one game. You might even get a couple of them. But if, if it comes down to it, night in and night out, those those bigs are going to wear you down. So that that is what we understand. Um <clears throat> And so, yeah, that's what I want to see. You know, I, I looked at uh, and saw a little clip of, of Wiseman's uh, action in the last game. I think he attempted like nine shots or eight shots. It was really active, hitting uh, corner uh, mid-range shots, uh, getting into his bag with little hooks and stuff, you know, head fakes in the paint, just going for for scoring. And that's what he is. He's a scorer, a very high-level scorer who ran into a knee injury in his second year in his career and you know who else ran into an injury in his second year with a knee a guy by the name of Michael Jordan <laughs> Michael Jordan had a season ending knee injury in his second season that I always refer to when I see rookies have that happen to them because there's nothing going to derail you in your second season if you could just heal properly heal properly and continue on a trajectory of building your body if you build in your body eating right your body should heal unless it has something wrong with it specifically you know what I mean as to which you probably have bigger problems anyway but if your body is normal and it should be able to heal properly, then that's all you need to be doing is allowing it to heal. And then from there, building. And I think that that's what they're doing with Wiseman. He's healed and in the process of trying to work his way into his very actual rookie season, which is basically what this is. Since he didn't get a whole lot of playing time in the first years. This will allow him to develop. Imagine that a concept that is very important for all players. <clears throat> they usually need about four to six years. To fully come into their own, both physically and NBA mentally wise, um, to learn all the, the little tricks of the trade, to get cooked a couple times, to know what they need to do to keep up with the speed. All these different things have to be worked into. And you're not going to have that out the gate unless you're Dame Lillard or Paolo Benchero or somebody like that. You know, rarely do rookies come in and turn the league up. So at this point, I'm not down on James Wiseman at all. I think the possibility of him turning exactly into who he was drafted to be is still there. It's still there. Just like I said about Markel Fultz. And now y'all see what Markel Fultz is doing. I knew he was going to do this back when people were talking about his shoulder. All they needed to do was figure out what the problem was. The kid was 19, 20 years old. Whatever the problem was, he wasn't going to be there when he was 25. And he still had plenty of career left if that was the case. So it's like the same for, for James Wiseman. Whatever the problem is, it ain't going to be there three years from now if he continues on the trajectory he's on. He's going to be somewhere playing basketball at a high level, getting better. And at that point, you're going to realize what his, what his true upside would have been from here. It's getting to that point that's a little difficult for teams like Golden State with their timeline out of whack and all of that. And they don't want to put themselves in a position to have to wait on a guy that they have to pay. They end up running to a THT Lakers situation where they end up giving that kid a young, uh, the young kid a, a bigger contract than they should and then still have to work on developing him as he struggles while on that contract. It makes it very difficult to build properly in their situation and ours specifically as well. So you just want to move on from the type of situation. You don't even want to go down that path. But when you're considering the fact that James Wiseman's a center who could score him um, for another team, uh, that, that is definitely a project you need to be picking up and running with. And so Detroit was a little questionable to me at the beginning because I didn't understand what they were doing. I didn't see the vision. And I didn't take into account the field that they probably really should be, you know, trying to match up with going forward with their timeline being as it is. And the rest of these long, stilty teams, they're on the same timeline as Detroit. <clears throat> so if they're going to beat these teams five years, six years down the road, four years down the road, whatever, 
they're going to need to start developing players that can meet those players at that time with the same upside. You know what I mean? So when you're looking at the field, you're not only looking at your timeline, but you're also trying to anticipate other teams' timelines. And that can be tricky because the game could change quickly. A couple injuries, a couple trades, you got an entirely different field. But generally, when you see what we see coming on the horizon with these super tall and long players who are obviously going to get a lot of money and stay with these teams that they go to, you know that you're going to have to match up with Chet. If you're in the Western Conference, if you don't have players that can match up with Chet Holmgren, he's going to have an advantage against you when he sees you. It just is what it is. You better see that coming. Just because he ain't running around right now, you better see that coming. Web Banyama, you don't know where he's going to land, but either conference needs to be prepared for that. You ain't going to be able to just run out there with a regular sized team. He's going to eat. These guys are too tall, too long, and too versatile. You know what I mean, these guys are like Kevin Durant with, with an extra foot on, on, their, on their height. Like, it's just, you cannot match up at all unless you start preparing. And as those guys go into year four, year five, year six, you want a guy who's good enough at year four, year five, year six. And that is exactly what Detroit is trying to build. So I get it. I get it. And on top of that, Durant's a defensive passing center. Wiseman's not known for his defense, even though obviously with his length, he can block shots. So there are going to be opportunities where you can run them together. And if you have the right system, because Wiseman can shoot, you can make it happen. And so I like the potential, depending on the style of play, depending on how those guys can ultimately mesh, depending on if that's even part of the vision. But I'd imagine with those guys being similar age and having similar upside, you definitely want to see them out there a lot. And if they find a way to keep them out there a lot, uh, they could be just as dangerous as a Cleveland, if not more so in some ways, depending on how well Kate Cunningham comes back and how well Ivy progresses, etc. Them getting rid of Sadiq Bay was interesting to me. Obviously, they still got Bogdanovich in place. I don't know if I would have chose Bogdanovich over Bay, given the fact that Bogdanovich is much older. I just didn't see the fruit. I didn't see the fruit in that. I, I know the contract that Bay had in my mind was a big one. But as I looked at the price on it, when I was looking at the trade tracker, it looked like it was only had like $2 million for two years or something like that. So I really don't know what Detroit had in mind there. I would have gone with the younger shooter um, and got rid of Bogdanovich, who had a really, really high value. Now, they priced him too high to move. That was a problem with Detroit. And now it doesn't really make sense for Bogdanovich to be on 18 because they don't necessarily have a timeline to compete this season. So they just dropped the ball not trading him. That's the bottom line. They traded Bay, a younger player, kept Bogdanovich, the older guy, and now can't win with him. It's just <laughs> you messed up. And it really comes down to them putting a price tag on Bogdanovich. It was too high. They wanted like two first round picks for him or something like that. I'm like, look, he's gonna be sitting there at the deadline and, and it's just gonna be you upset with the with the with the with the player uh, on your roster because you did not manage it properly. So that's what I just see there. Mismanagement a mistake, uh, just overpricing a, a player that it can really, really get you something and, and ultimately not, not doing what you need to do to assure that, that he's moved. Now, they do have him on contract for multiple seasons, so I do have to amend that. I keep forgetting that. He's not expiring. But at the end of the day, he's already like 33 years old, and the rest of your timeline is, is rookie and sophomore. <laughs> Detroit ain't doing nothing. So he, by the very nature of having him on contract for multiple years doesn't make any sense at all. It don't. They should have had him turn into a younger player or to multiple pieces that fit the timeline a bit better, uh, in my humble opinion. But they like the player. They're moving forward. Age is just a number to them. So uh, everything else around the team is young. Whatever. But when it, when your guy's in his 30s and he's playing at a high level uh, and you got a young team, uh, that that's a no-go. That's an absolute no-go. So, yeah, they, they botched that particular aspect of it. But I like, I like the, the Wiseman piece. I like the idea there. And, uh, you know, obviously Ivy's going to be a stud one day. Cunningham, it, the jury's out on Cunningham, man. I ain't going to lie. And I know that you would say, but you said the same thing about the, the, the Michael Jordan knee injury thing. I know I did. But here's the problem that I have with Cade. The problem I have with Cade is his lack of athleticism, man. He's not an athletic star. He's really, really talented, way talented. And when he puts it all together and gets in his best shape, he can really, really just 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 make all-star teams and stuff no problem i think the issue for me is i don't know if he's ever going to turn into a guy that's physically imposing enough to take on the roles that he's going his talent is going to demand of him can he take that punishment that's my question it's like okay you want a guy like him to play 38 to 42 minutes 
every night be your superstar, hopefully make an MVP, win an MVP. I don't know if his body can do that. I don't know if his body can do that. And so that's my concern about Cade Cunningham. I'm not saying they need to move on from Cade Cunningham necessarily at all. But if I can get an equivalent level star for Cade Cunningham, I'm going to swap them. I'm going to swap them because I just I don't personally trust his body. Now, long term, he's going to be a heck of a player. He's going to make a lot of all star teams. A lot of this. What I'm saying, if he doesn't have injury issues, it is, does, isn't relevant because if he doesn't have injury issues, I think he's going to be ridiculous. So don't don't think twice about that. But for guys like that, if they take on enough injuries, the talent level that they have just overall lowers because they get those injuries are going to make it so that they can't be number one stars. He's going to end up being rendered to a number two or number three. And that is not what they drafted him to be first overall two years ago. That's that's not what they drafted him to be. And so even though I think Ivy's upside is probably just as high when it all said and done, that has nothing to do with what the ceiling the Pistons believe they have if Kate Cunningham turns into who he's supposed to. So if I could turn Kate Cunningham into another player, the same upside to where I feel like, yeah, he going to be like Kate Cunningham, I'm going to swap them out, man. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do it early, and we'll just take a chance because – I don't like where he's headed. With him particularly, I don't like it. I don't like the role that he's in because of that. You know, because of what it is it looks like to me in regards to his health. And I, I just think that it's going to be difficult to make him a number one in this NBA. It's going to be very difficult. So that's my take. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hot and cold on Detroit in certain areas, obviously, as you can see. But the ones that, that matter, I think, are solid. Going after Bagley and Wiseman, it's a risk. That could go left if those guys don't develop at all. But it's a low risk because they don't cost much when you get them. So, yeah, I I like the roster for the most part. Like I said, Bogdanovich is balling. It ain't like he's not delivering. It's just his age and having him on multiple years. You think he's going to deliver like this next year, year after that? Is it going to be as easy to move him? Probably not. You could have got got rid of him for for a big price tag here. Priced it too high. Now you ain't going to be able to get him for half of that next time you you shop him. So, it's just... Yeah, that was just a, a mistake on their part, in my humble opinion. And maybe they were trying to shop it and just couldn't get nothing done. And you don't want to pull the trigger on something ridiculous, lowball, lowballing yourself. So I could see something like that. It may have taken place. But the mistake was made when they priced him that high in the first place. So that is my Pistons talk. Obviously, you guys know I'm a Laker fan. I do not watch the Pistons. So this is all secondhand, you know, from afar. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about the players' tendencies too much and nothing like that. I'm just telling you what I see in regards to their roster construction. And some of the some of the things that they're doing, I really like. And some of the things that they're doing, I think they could do a little better. And overall, if I were a Pistons fan, I'd feel pretty optimistic that, that we're, we're, we're barking up the right tree. So that's what I wanted to say, man. Just wanted to give you all a little taste of my mind in regards to a different type of team other than my own today. I do that at random sometimes. So that's where we're at, BDF44. I thank you all for watching.